the Lord. Amen. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. God is great. Hallelujah. Thank you, Tim. Great job as always. You're always spot on, and I'm so grateful for uh, the way God uses you to confirm things to me, and it's all part of the body, and I, I just appreciate it so much that you really put your heart into this, and, uh, and I can tell. It makes a great, build, great deal of difference to me, and I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Suzanne and Mike. Thank you all for uh, helping us to, to have church, praise the Lord. Eric pushing buttons, flipping dials, and doing all that he's doing back there. Tammy and all of you all helping us to worship the Lord. It's a great thing. Praise God. So we're thankful for that. Amen. And I have an assistant here that's I'm not sure what she's after. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. God is good. Welcome to all of you out there. Uh, watching us on live stream, Darlene and uh, Don, we appreciate you being there, and all the others that are participating in this service, we appreciate you being there, and you are a part of the service, and, and we appreciate the fact that you're worshiping with us, amen, so God is good. The remnant, praise God. So anyway, thank you all very much, and... Uh, the soup thing is as much a surprise to me as it was to anybody else. In fact, probably more of a surprise. These, you know, when you get to a certain age, you just kind of like to let it just mm. move on to the next one. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I'm grateful for every one the Lord gives me. I'm not as excited about celebrating them today as I was 50 years ago or something. Praise the Lord. But it's all good. Amen. God has a purpose and a plan, and we're just grateful to be part of it. Amen. Had the grandkids were over, well, last, last Saturday night they spent the night before ch came to church with us, but they have, uh, up, uh, I've got, upstairs I've got a bunch of their art supplies and just papers and pads and pencils and paint and a little bit of everything. So whenever they come over, if the weather's not such that they can be outside, then they come up there and they'll draw their pictures and write letters and play school and do all the other stuff they do. So uh, I've got a battery oper operated pencil sharpener because they've got a lot of colored pencils and stuff. But I forgot to get batteries for it. It's got the, like, the triple A's. It's something you just don't hang, have laying around the house, right? So I didn't have that. But Sally had a manual one and was letting him use that. And I said, well, you know, just don't worry about it. You can just use the pencils like they are. And one of them said, well, pencils that aren't sharpened are pointless. <laughs> well, one of the, I'm sure they were thinking that. I don't know that. I'm not sure if one of them said it or not, if it just kind of went through my head and I thought one of them did. But. But it's true, praise the Lord. So I'm in this math thing, and I kind of stuck on that for today. But I'm going to ask you a question here. Why did the mathematician work from home? Come on, Peter. He could only function in his domain. I'm watching for your reaction, because I know you're back there. I'm thinking Critiquing, thank you. Uh, you know, I knew a mathematician, and he couldn't even afford lunch. He could buy no meal. <laughs> buy no meal. Yes, buy no meal. meal. <laughs> Apparently, you're not into math quite like I am. Praise the Lord. But I noticed the other day, too, a slingshot was confiscated in an algebra class for being a weapon of math disruption. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. Just being mean, you know, it is my birthday. <laughs> Work with me a little bit here, praise God. All right, so I, again, I appreciate uh, Tim's uh, words this morning and, and then the different ones that were commenting, Tammy as well as others, but uh, it really gave me a, a, a confirmation of what I feel like the Lord wants me to share with you this morning. And so I'd like to begin with uh, Romans 15, verse 4, Suzanne. Romans 15 and 4. So all of the Bible is, there's a purpose for it. And that purpose is to, to help us to understand what God's trying to do in our lives, what he's trying to teach us. So it's not just history lessons. It's not just, uh, you know, facts that have been written down. 
but it's whatsoever things were written aforetime, or when this was written. Everything that was written before was written for a purpose, and that purpose is our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And so with that, I'd like to go to Genesis 25, verses 7 and 8. So everything in this Bible, it's not to make us feel bad. It's not to make us feel guilty or ashamed. It's to comfort us and give us hope for what God is doing in our lives. And these are all stories that are talking about us. They're not just his, history lessons about something that happened to people that lived thousands of years ago or something. It's about us. It's about how God wants to, us to relate to him and how he wants to relate to us. So this is Genesis chapter 25, verses 7 and 8. And I was reading some things uh, earlier in the week. You know, Abraham, of course, we know all of his issues, and, or, or most of us do. And, but I, I kind of lost track. You know, after uh, Sarah died, he took another wife, Keturah, and they had multiple children. I mean, I forget now what it is, but four or five sons at least. And then when, uh, after Sarah died, or after uh, Isaac married uh, Rebekah, he sent all these other sons and daughters away that were the offspring of these concubines. So he had a, you know, he had a pretty weird strange kind of life. You know what I mean? If you think about all the things that he had done and, and the disobedience and all that, and yet it says these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived. A hundred, three score and fifteen years, or 175 years he lived. And then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now in the original writing, if you have your Bible out, you'll see that full of years is in italics because it wasn't in the original writing. But what it means is an old man satisfied with life. I'll give you the, uh, the actual word in the place. You can look it up in Strong's if you want to to see that. But he was an old man satisfied with life. That's what it says, okay? So then look at Romans 8 and 1. Without, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That literally translates, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who, are, who live in union with Christ. So we're, we'll say not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That isn't in the original writing either, but it's just talking about living in union with Jesus. There's no con condemnation for a person who's living in Christ who's one with Jesus, who's been born again, in other words, all right? So we go back to Abraham lived 175 years, and then he died, an old man satisfied with life. Uh, again, that of years is, is italicized because it wasn't in the original writing, but that full of life, that comes from uh, number 7649 in the Hebrew, in Strong's Concordance, it's Sabaya, and it means satisfied with. So he was an old man satisfied with life when he died. Now, satisfied with life. That's, to me, that's a great epitaph for a person of any age. Amen. Old, young, in between, to be satisfied with their life. Amen? And it's also interesting to, to notice that when you say this about a man who lived as long as Abraham did and made as many obviously bad choices as he made in his life. Amen? Now, if you... If you're thinking uh, and you're kind of used to thinking about Abraham as this biblical character who had it all together, then you need to think again and again and again. Amen. Because over the course of his life, Abraham fell into cowardice, deceit, and disobedience multiple times. Two times he passed his own wife off as his sister and let her be taken away by other men just to save himself. He didn't know what the outcome of that was going to be. I'm sure he had a pretty good idea what it would be, but he did it anyway because it was the only way he could protect himself, to keep him from being harmed so that they would take his wife. Amen? He tried to make God's promises. God gave him promises, and then Abraham tried to make them come to pass by his own ability. Amen? And he even developed his own strategy in order to make it happen. 
It's exactly what Tim was talking about, how we get in the way uh, instead of just trusting God. See, if Naaman would have stopped at six, it might have made perfect sense to him, but he never got healed. Right? Abraham had a son, but it wasn't the promised son. It wasn't the one through whom God was going to work. Right? So he, he, with all of these failures, amen, he died an old man satisfied with life. That ought to be an encouragement. I know it is for me, amen, and it should be for all of us. And I noticed while I was doing this, I, I came up, there's a parallel here between Abram and Simon, or Abraham and Peter. Praise the Lord. I will get to that in a moment. But did you ever wonder how Abraham found that satisfaction? An old man satisfied with life? How he learned to deal with regret how he learned to deal with the condemnation of his own conscience. Because you know, he knew that wasn't the thing to do when he did it. Whatever, whichever and all of the things that he did, he knew. So it had to come back to him. That was really, that was evil. That was foul. That was the dumbest. That was the most cowardice. You know, all the things that would go through a person's mind after they had done something like that. But how did he learn to deal with this? He obviously knew something about living above condemnation. And in the confidence of his relationship with God. The Bible says he knew God. Right? He believed God. And God counted that as righteousness. There have been very few in our world that have found out what Abraham's secret is. If they had, there'd be fewer frowns and more smiles. There'd be less stress and more peace. There'd be less selfishness and more generosity. There'd be less judgment and more grace. In so many ways, we live in a culture of condemnation, especially in religious circles. In fact, religion has refined condemnation to an art form, and we've all experienced it. Condemnation is used as a tool, and it's used to convert people into religious behavior from heathen behavior. I don't know where church you went to or what kind of church, but I'm telling you, condemnation was a big factor in the church that I was in. Amen? You were constantly being measured to a standard that nobody could keep. So condemnation was part of it. It was just part of it. It was supposed to have been a motivation. Actually, it was depressing and it was discouraging. But condemnation is also the weapon of choice for shaping the consciences of young people and influencing the decisions of adults and the tragedy of all this is there's no place for condemnation in Christ's body there's no place for condemnation in the church none whatsoever look at Romans 8 1 again there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk in unity or who are one with him or who have been born again that is an emphatic statement no condemnation. It just isn't there. It doesn't exist in Christ. For anyone in Christ to experience condemnation, he or she would have to get outside, reach outside of Christ in order to get it. The liberating truth of the gospel is no condemnation. Praise the Lord. That's great when it's for me. But maybe not so much when it's for you. Hallelujah. Amen. I, imagine with me for a moment. You're standing in the middle of a, of a room. All the lights are off. You can't see your hand in front of your face. The furniture scattered all over the place. Everything's out of place. And it's your responsibility to put everything in order. But every time you move, you bump into something. You're not fixing anything. You're just stumbling around, basically, in the dark, hurting yourself as you're trying to do this, right? It's your responsibility. And that's how condemnation feels. You're in a mess, but you can't do anything about fixing it. And the more you try, the more painful it becomes, and the less gets accomplished. You're just conscious of your failure or your inability to fix the mess. And then somebody turns on the light. Now, the room's still a mess, but at least you can see the mess now, right? That's Jesus, the light of the world. John 12, 46. 
you can see what needs to be taken care of. Your eyes are open to the problem, right? He said, I've come a light to the world that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. He turns on the light. 1 John 3, 19 through 24. 1 John 3, 19 through 24. Praise the Lord. We're, we're in a new year. We're in a new phase, I believe, of what God is doing in the church and with us individually as well as collectively. And I think we really need to take some of these things seriously that we have kind of just poo-pooed and said, yeah, well, grace is great. This needs to be a reality in our lives if we're going to move forward in what God has for us in this new year. And in fact, for our entire future. So hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemneth, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemneth us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. That's the requirement. Believe and love. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. Praise the Lord. So here we're seeing we have two choices. We can live with confidence, or we can live with condemnation. God's grace has been poured out to us, and his unconditional love has been extended to us. And now it's up to us. Do we listen to the voice of condemnation? Or do we listen to the voice of confidence? The scripture we read in 1 John defines confidence as the freedom to ask God things knowing we receive what we request according to his words or his commandments. Amen? Keeping commandments, right? 1 John 3, verse 23, the definition of commandment is that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and that we then love one another. Right? In another place, He says that we love God and we love one another. That fulfills all the law and the prophets. So we receive from God based on grace through faith. Everything we get is done that way. There's nothing that we need to do to gain acceptance. Amen. There's nothing we need to do to get God to bring us in or receive us into his presence. There are no unfulfilled requirements to be in right standing with God. None. Zero. Confidence is a choice. We can trust our relationship with God and his promise of no condemnation. Praise the Lord. Or... We can choose to squirm in this messy misery of condemnation. Knowing that we haven't done what's expected and feeling worthless because of our failure. Practically speaking, how do we make the choice? Well, first of all, you have to understand that condemnation usually comes from one of two channels. Other people's judgments or our own consciousness of failure. And of course, the ultimate source is the devil himself who moves on people and ourselves to get into condemnation. Why? Because condemnation will stop your faith in what God wants to do in your life. We really can't do anything about other people's opinions. I gave up on that years ago. Praise the Lord. I mean, I like people to like me, but if they don't, there's not a whole lot I can do about it, and I don't stay awake nights worrying about it. So I can't do anything about how other people feel about me or their opinions of me except to refuse to receive them as the final word. Yeah. That's an opinion. You're welcome to it. You have every right to it, but I don't have to receive it. Praise the Lord. It's possible to learn to live above the voice of a condemning conscience, even your own. See, God chose to change Abram's name to Abraham. And why? Because he was describing an ultimate reality that would be that man. So he uses a name change to set him up for what God wants him to be. 
what God has already declared him to be. Amen? And Jesus called Simon Peter, the rock, describing his eventual character. Now, I'm sure you all, we all think of things that we've done or have said or thought or whatever that bug us, right? Well, God's got, given you a new name. You, just, you don't know it yet, but he has given you a new name. It's in Revelation. He'll, you'll, you'll know it one day, and you know why you'll know it? Because you will have become that name. You will have fulfilled your destiny, your purpose in Christ, and you'll know that's your name. That's who you are. Amen? If you look in the Bible... Names are critically important in the Bible. They don't mean as much to us today as they once did. But people gave children names that would define their future. That would define who they were going to be. Right? So, to God, a name really is more than just a moniker. More than just something you sign a check with. But it's defining who you are. It's describing who you are to him. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that about the name that you carry on your birth certificate. I'm talking about the name that God has chosen. And the truth is, we are all Jesus Christ in the sense that that's how God sees us. Amen? That's the name that he has given us. Praise the Lord. And so, it, uh, Peter was far from being rock-like. I mean, come on. Just like Abram, he was a screw-up. He was disobedient. He was foolhardy. He was ignorant at times. Amen? And so he was like the rock during the life of Jesus on this earth, even though that's the name that Jesus gave him, Peter. Amen? He, Peter, was brash. He was overconfident. And yet, at the same time, he was insecure. He was a blowhard, but he was, a, he was unsure of himself at the same time, which is not unusual for people. That a lot of times, the more aggressive and outspoken they are, the more unsure they are of themselves, and that's why they act that way, to cover up for their own insecurities and so forth. So the flaws didn't shock Jesus. Amen. He expected incomplete people to be incomplete. Jesus called Peter to follow him, knowing all of his problems, but also knowing that his grace was enough to make Peter a vessel of honor. That's true of every one of us. And the more we begin to kind of uh, self-analyze, you know, and yeah. scrutinize ourselves, the more we find that we're not happy with. But Jesus has declared us the righteousness of God in Christ, just as he did Abraham. He said he is righteous because of his belief in me or because of his faith in me, not because of anything he did, because if he went by what he did, you'd have to say this guy is a complete failure. Mm -hmm. And why in the world would God want to use him? Because God knew his destiny. Amen? Matthew 26, uh, verse 31 through 35. Matthew 26, 31 through 35. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I'm risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I not be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said the disciples. So here's a guy who's obviously out of touch with reality. I mean, he's not looking clearly at himself or the people that are around him. I mean, he's blustering with this pride or this self-justification and superiority, amen, and he's sure he has arrived, and everybody else is just getting on the train, right? I mean, that's kind of his attitude towards everybody else. No wonder there was bickering and stuff going on. He's saying, these are all failures. They're all flops. They're not, none of them are going to make it, but not me. I'll be there. I got your back. You know, I'm with you. I, I, I won't deny you. I won't give up on you. And he thinks his intelligence, his personality, his ability to receive revelation, because remember he had, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, hey, that came from God, that's revelation. But at the same time, you need to turn away from me because you're acting like the devil. So one minute he's got revelation, the next minute he's siding with the enemy. 
Amen. So he says uh, this revelation, all that he has and everything that he's understood, he, he, th he believes that this has qualified him to stand head and shoulders above everybody else. He really believes when others fail, he won't. And Jesus' response to this is Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. I mean, I can tell you, I've had conversations like this with the Lord multiple times. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And so Jesus basically says, Peter, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news, I'll give you the bad news first. The bad news is Satan asked permission to sift you like wheat. The good news, he had to ask because you don't belong to him, you belong to me. The bad news is, I gave him permission. Good news, I prayed for you, and all my prayers are answered. Bad news, you're going to need those prayers. The good news, your faith won't fail. The bad news, everything but your faith will. And we know Peter denies Jesus three times after having run away from Jesus when he was arrested. Peter's failure is epic, but to God, it's the exposure that's going to lead to opening for the grace of God to flow into his life, the mess of Peter's life, and that's where God's going to pour the glory of his forgiveness and his restoration. Why? So God gets the glory, and Peter gets his destiny. Jesus appeared to his disciple three times before, after, after he had been resurrected. Amen. And it's the third appearance that really makes this huge difference. In John uh, 21, we don't have to go there. We all know the story, but I'm just going to share it with you here briefly. And the boys are out fishing. Jesus walks out on the beach, and John says, It, it must be the Lord. And they're out in the boat, right? But Peter's the first one to jump into the water. Right? He rips off his clothes, jumps in the water, and heads to Jesus. And at first it looks just like the same old Peter. Impetuous. Overconfidence. But at a second glance, there's more. And imagine what's going through Peter's mind. What's in his conscience? Condemning voices. Failure. Coward. You forfeited. You gave up your place in this thing. You didn't have the guts to stand up for the Lord. You lied. You deceived. You, you, you denied him. Remember, this is the third time that Jesus had met with his disciples since the resurrection. And he hasn't once mentioned Peter's failure. The only thing he says about Peter is tell Peter to come to. That, it's really different. It's so unlike people who think perfection is goal and sin then must be the focus. In the face of failure, a law-trained conscience screams condemnation. Religionists howl for justice, for punishment. But it's the restoring grace of Jesus that calls somebody who has no merit to come and receive total forgiveness. That's our God. That's our Jesus. That's grace. Jesus' restoration doesn't stop with purging the conscience. He not only forgives the failures of Peter, he goes to the root of the problem to heal Peter, to purify his heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, we think. We condemn ourselves and others. Let's look at this, John 21, verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? 
Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Now he's speaking to him in his old name. Not in his destiny, but the way Peter sees himself. Right? Not the rock. This wishy-washy, up-and-down failure, Simon. And so he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So here's the deal. To throw yourself on the full knowledge of God is never a bad choice. I've had to do it multiple times. And you might as well because he does know. So you might as well be honest. To allow God the final verdict is true wisdom. You can be sure his verdict is going to be higher than justice. Mercy triumphs over justice. Actually, Jesus had been given Peter his verdict from the very beginning. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He'd been trying to say to Peter during that whole experience, I know something about you that you don't know. I wouldn't trust my sheep to somebody who didn't love me. Jesus was, in fact, trying to get Peter to live not by the condemnation of his conscience, but by the voice of a merciful, gracious, loving God, his Father. So the world and religion and conscience will always scream for indictment, for judgment, for payment. And that's because they're always measuring according to the technicalities of right behavior. But God always zeroes in on the intent of the heart. 1 John 3, 19 through 24. Am I depressing people here today? Praise the Lord. This is, this is actually good news. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. <clears throat> Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things with that are pleasing to him. Now, what are the commandments? We already know they are. Right? Love God. Focus on Jesus. Believe in the Son, Jesus Christ. And love one another. It's the only demand. He that keepeth the commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he gave us. When you don't like the indictment that's passed against you because of your conscience or somebody else's conscience, or when it conflicts with somebody else, your course of action is to appeal to a higher court. A court with a greater judgment. A court with a greater judge. Because God is greater than our hearts. So back to Peter. If religionists were watching this process that was taking place here between Jesus and Peter on that beach, this, this process of Jesus restoring Peter or bringing restoration... No doubt they would have uh, accused Jesus of not being tough enough on sin. They had done that multiple times before. The woman caught in the act of adultery. I mean, multiple, you can see it over and over through the scripture. And he says, do you love me? See, Jesus' conversation focuses on Peter's inner attitude, not on his failure or his betrayal. How many know you can really do stupid stuff and still love the Lord? Amen. We all do. We all have. Right, praise the Lord. The word Jesus uses, love, is a word that's beyond Peter's ability to even comprehend. It's, it's agape love, which means God love. Or it means unending, unconditional, everlasting, never failing love. Peter, do you love 
more. Amen? Or do you have love like this more than these others do? In other words, have you got more agape love than Thomas, than, right, than the others? Only God can agape unconditional, unending love. Peter, do you have more of that kind of love than these other disciples do? So Peter uses the word filio, which is brotherly love or human love. And there's two things to notice here. First, for Jesus, the important issue in Peter's restoration wasn't so much the act of the betrayal, but the condition of his heart. Right? Jesus wanted Peter to operate out of an honest relationship with him. And then secondly, Jesus has the audacity to take a total failure and give him the job of feeding his sheep. Praise the Lord. The sheep Jesus loves so much, amen, hurting humans. The people that Jesus left heaven and came to earth and died for. And now he's going to turn these over to the care of a colossal failure. Oh, shoot. I don't know. Look, I don't know where anybody here is but me. And if you think that God doesn't know you and have faith in you, in spite of your weaknesses, in spite of your shortcomings, and yet he's still willing to use you to reach the lost. He still has confidence because he knows your end. He knows your, how you have been defined by him. We're still dealing with our conscience, and that's part of the reason why we probably don't do as much outreach and, and witnessing and, and loving people and praying and going after them and doing whatever we can to help them to become a part of the body of Christ because of our own shame, because of our own failure, because of our own weaknesses. But that's the confidence that Jesus has in this guy once he's been restored by grace. A total failure. I mean, a, a betrayer of God. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. We're like Peter. We're like Abraham. We're not patched up, painted over objects. But equipped saints prepared to declare the glory of God, but also to demonstrate in our own lives the reality of His unfailing love. And as a result, we should find it hard to look down our noses at sinners. We should find it difficult to judge failures around us. Praise the Lord. Instead, we're to view them as one of us, candidates for God's expression of grace, candidates for the love of God to be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Something's happened in our hearts that makes it possible for us to grasp the essence of Romans 5.20, where grace, where sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound. Amen. The law was given, amen, to bring guilt, to bring shame, to bring condemnation. And he said that where sin abounds, grace overwhelms it. Doth that much more abound. Amen. So find Simon learned this truth. And truly became Peter. That's the answer to the seemingly contradictory life of Abram. A man so clearly flawed and yet Abraham. He lived 175 years. Died an old man. Satisfied with his life. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'll take that testimony. Anytime. A man who believed God, not the devil, 
not his conscience, not other people's judgment, no condemnation. So that we might have hope. Praise the Lord. God's got some tremendous things in store for this church. I'm talking about for you individually. Amen. But because of that, it blesses all of us collectively. Yes. And I'm telling you, with all of my heart, if we believe this message, if we'll live this message, we're going to see God moving in our midst. Yes. Amen? Yes. wasn't because Abraham was perfect. In fact, he was so flawed from the natural point of view, you'd have to say this guy is never going to amount to anything except creating more problems. And yet, he lived a long life satisfied with it. Peter, the rock, looked like such a joke, just like it looked like Abram. This guy who couldn't have kids, never had kids, and God calls him the father of many nations. I mean, so far from what we would think of as reality. And yet God says, that's your destiny. That's what I've called you to. That will take place. And it won't happen because of what you're doing. It'll happen because of what I'm doing. And what I'm doing will eventually change what you're doing. That's your destiny. And it's the same way with Peter. Simon, this fluctuating idiot in a lot of ways, so full of himself that he couldn't see past that to who Jesus described him as. He was always trying to live up to something that he could never be on his own. Nothing wrong with the desire to be better. The problem was he was incapable of doing it. It wasn't until he settled into the destiny that Jesus had for him. Love me and love one another. And you'll see your destiny fulfilled. That's what God's saying to the church today. That's my honest to God belief. He's saying, make me the focus. Love me. Believe in me. And then you'll be able to love one another. Amen. Amen. If you believe in the love that God has for you, you should be able to love people that are pretty screwed up. Amen. Because unless you're a lot different than me, you don't deserve this love that he keeps giving us. We don't deserve the destiny that he has provided for us. Amen. But we get it nevertheless. Because we are who we are in Him. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, I made this brief because, well, it is my birthday and it's all about me. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> amen. Love you all. Appreciate you being here. Let's take this to heart. Amen. I know. Look, this is, this is the discipline of Christianity. This is about being a disciple. And this is how it's done. Amen. Amen. We focus on the Lord. We believe in Him. And out of that faith in Him, we can love one another, even with all of our screw-ups. Praise the Lord. And that will transform people's lives. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's do it. God bless you all. Father, bless this food. All that are about to partake of it, thank you for it. Thank you for all the people that are here today. And bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Dismissed in the name of the Lord.